Welcome to Wheelock's Latin, Chapter 31. In this chapter, we're going to be exploring the cum clauses, and we'll be looking at a new irregular verb, ferro, ferreri, tuli, latum. Let's do a quick review of our uses of subjunctive. We have previously studied the jessif, the purpose clauses, result clauses, and indirect questions. In this chapter, we're going to be adding cum clauses. Now, cum clauses are not only used with subjunctive, but they're also used with indicative verbs. So we'll be looking at both of those, but since it's used quite a bit with subjunctive verbs, I've got it here under our uh, ongoing list of the uses of subjunctive. So cum clauses we'll be looking at here as well. Let's go ahead and look at cum clauses. Now, as a reminder, we have already seen cum primarily used as a preposition. We translate it as the word with. But cum clauses is going to be a bit different. Obviously, when cum is followed by a noun in the ablative case, then you know that it is simply a preposition, and you'll translate it as with. But cum clauses is going to be just a bit different. Let's look at this. The definition of a cum clause. This is the use of cum as a conjunction, not a preposition. It will be introducing a subordinate clause, which describes an action connected in one way or another with the main clause. Sometimes the verb in this subordinate clause will be indicative, and sometimes it will be subjunctive. So let's look first at the indicative cum clauses. We call these cum temporal clauses. We call these cum temporal clauses because this, the secondary clause describes the precise time of the action of the main verb. Now you're going to recognize a cum temporal clause because the secondary verb will be in the indicative mood. It's pretty simple. If you see cum in a clausal form, in other words, it's introducing a clause uh, and it's not being followed by an ablative, then you know it's a cum clause. And if it's uh, the, the verb in that clause is indicative, then you know that this is a cum temporal clause. The way you're going to translate a cum clause, a cum temporal clause, is that you're going to, again, translate cum as when, or it could be while. And then tum is sometimes found in the main clause, and cum tum can be translated as not only, but also. So cum temporal clause, it describes the precise time of action of the main verb, so it's based on time. You'll recognize it because the secondary verb in the clause there is indicative, and you'll be translating cum as when or possibly while. Let's look at an example of a cum temporal clause. Again, this is going to be a verb in the a secondary verb in the indicative mood. Here we have cum et um vedebus, excuse me, vedebus et um cognosces. Cum vedebus. So this is when. Obviously, cum is not. Uh, preceding an ablative noun, so we know it's a cum clause. You see, widdebis is a uh, uh, future tense, active, second person, singular verb. So you have, uh, you will see, uh, um him, there's our direct object, when you will see him, comma, main sentence here is um cognosces, you will recognize him. When you will see him, you will recognize him. So the connection between this secondary verb, the wedebis, uh, is that it is uh, based on a time or temporal relationship with the main verb. The knowing or the recognizing is happening at the same time as the seeing. When you will see him, you will recognize him. Here's another example. Cum winkimus, tum pacem speras. Cum winkimus, when you will conquer. Again, winkimus, active uh, future tense, first person plural, you will conquer cum, when camus, so we got our cum clause, uh, not a preposition here. So when you will conquer, comma, tum pacem speras, then tum speras, you are hoping. This is a first conjugation verb in the active present tense, second person singular. Then you are hoping pacem for peace. When you will conquer, then you are hoping for peace. So again, it's a temporal relationship between these two verbs. Now let's look at examples of uh, something other than indicative when the cum clause is in the subjunctive. All right, now here's a definition, and there's actually going to be three different definitions here because we have three classes or categories of subjunctive 
Coombe clauses. The first one is called the Coombe Circumstantial Clause. And this is where the clause is used to describe the general circumstances when the main action has occurred. It's not about time, it's just the general circumstances. We also have a Coombe Causal Clause. This is used to describe the cause of the main action. And then finally, we have the Coombe Adversative Clause. And this is a clause that's used to describe a circumstance that might have obstructed the main action or is in some other way opposed to it. So these are three categories of subjunctive Coombe clauses. How do we recognize them? Well, first you'll recognize the difference between a Coombe temporal clause and any of these other clauses, these three other categories, because the subjunctive verb or the secondary verb is going to be in the subjunctive mood. So that automatically sets these three apart from the cum temporal clause, which of course the secondary verb is, is indicative. Now as far as distinguishing these three categories of subjunctive cum clauses, you're going to have to analyze the relationship between the secondary and primary verbs. Uh, when you just look at the context and analyze these relationships, they will just sort of naturally fall into one of these three categories, either circumstantial, causal, or adversative. And also, if it's an adversative cum clause, tamen will often be in the main clause. That'll help you recognize a cum adversative clause. Now, as far as translating these cum clauses, uh, as uh, most frequently we've seen, that when you have a subjunctive verb in a clause, you're going to translate it as indicative. And of course, as we've already mentioned, cum is not going to be translated as our preposition with. We will be translating as a conjunction, when, since, or although, depending on the type of cum clause. Let's look at a couple of examples of each of these. Here's an example of a circumstantial cum clause. Cum hoc fecisset ad te fugit. Cum fecisset. Here we have a subjunctive uh, pluperfect uh, verb uh, from facao. So it's when he had done hoc this. Uh, again, pluperfect. So we're translated as indicative pluperfect. When he had done this. Ad te fugit. He fled to me. So that's circumstantial. That's the relationship between the main verb and the secondary verb here is the circumstances surrounding the action of the main verb. What were the circumstances surrounding the fleeing? It's, it's when he had done this. It's, it's about that time that it had happened. It's around that. That's the circumstances. I guess that's the best way to say it here. Causal. Cum hoc skiret potuereos uare. Uh, here we have skiret, which is subjunctive uh, imperfect. And so we have, again, it's, it's subjunctive, but it's in the cause, uh, cum clause, so we're going to translate as indicative. Cum, we're going to translate as since. Since he knew this, potuit et osuare, he was able to help them. So this is a cause and effect kind of relationship between the main verb and the secondary verb. So we went with since. And then finally, the adversative cum clause, cum hoc skiret, tamen meletes meset. So again, we've got skiret in the imperfect subjunctive. And cum here, we're going to translate as although. We see tamen. We said often will be an adversative. That might be an indicator that's an adversative cum clause. And so although he knew it, tamen, nevertheless, misit melites, he sent the soldiers. So here's, these are examples of all three of the cum clauses in the subjunctive mood. Uh, circumstantial, causal, and adversative. So if you need to go ahead and go back through these examples and sort of analyze them, make sure you read the chapter and get a good handle on uh, these cum clauses. Now, let's jump into the next part of this lesson, which is the irregular verb ferro, feri, tuli, latum. And uh, what probably jumps out at you pretty quickly is the irregular form of the infinitive here. Normally we have, and this, by the way, is a third conjugation verb, so you would expect an e a short e to be between the two r's here. You would expect it to be ferreri. But this is an irregular verb. That e has dropped off, so we end up with ferre. And the other thing that makes this um, uh, irregular is looking at the third and fourth principal parts. They don't look anything like ferro, ferre. Um, so this is something you'll have to memorize with your vocabulary. Let's look at um, how this verb is irregular as you conjugate it. It's only in a couple of places, uh, and it's really in the 
present tense that we're going to see, both active and passive, that we're going to see an irregular irregularity, which uh, basically boils down to the connecting vowel or the stem vowel is going to be missing in a couple of forms. Let's look at the indicative active here, present system. We've got the ferro, and, and, and you would compare this to a third conjugation verb like ago. We would have ago, agis, agit, that short e um, shifts to an i, so we'd have ago, agis, agit. And here you notice we have ferro, fers, fert. We're missing the i in both the second person singular and the third person singular. You would expect it to be ferro, feris, ferit, but it's missing in second singular, third singular. We do see it in first plural, ferimus. It is also missing in second plural. We would expect it to be ferritis. Instead, it is fertis. And it, we do have the, the vowel back here, the u. Remember, third conjugation, it shifts to a u in third plural. And here we have ferunt. So in three places here that are um, uh, demarked by the, sh the, the color of the, of the text here, it's in that uh, I don't know what you call that peach color, I guess, but it's not in black. So that's indicating um, that, that, that we have an irregularity in the conjugation form here. If you notice imperfect and future, it's exactly what we'd expect. We have the E vowel with the bomb, boss, bot, bombus, bot, this bond, exactly what you'd expect for a third conjugation verb. And then in the future, we have the present, uh, present tense endings, M, S, T, must, this, int, with the A in first person singular for future, and the rest is an E for the rest of the future form. So we end up with feram, feres, feret, feremus, feretis, ferent. And, uh, and again, this is exactly what you'd expect. So only in the present tense in three forms, second and third singular and second plural, do we have an irregularity. And uh, that's a little late. <laughs> there you go, that should have already followed through. Let's look at the passive form. You're gonna see the exact same thing in passive. Uh, a couple of irregularities in the present tense, but not the exact same places. We will see it in, again, second and third singular, but that's it. We end up with ferro er. We're going to add that passive ending r to ferro. So we end up ferroar, ferroar. Sorry, it's hard to say that. And then we end up with f e r r i s, feris. Again, we're missing that connecting vowel that we would expect. Uh, we would normally have agor, ageris. And here we're missing that, uh, that E. And again, uh, uh, ferter, we're missing the connecting vowel there. But for, th uh, for plural passive here, ferimer, ferimini, ferunter uh, is exactly what you'd expect. So only again, second and third person singular present tense. Imperfect or future, exactly what you'd expect with your bar, baris, bater, bomber, bomini, bonter, and your aris, ter, mermini, inter uh, with the appropriate vowels there. So you'll just have to memorize these irregular forms in present tense, and then the rest should fall into place. And again, there is my little box that I'm a little late in using. There you go. Now, as far as conjugating this in a uh, perfect system, uh, it's exactly what you expect. Third principal part, tuli. We drop that I ending and use our uh, perfect endings, e is the it, emus is this erunt, or for pluperfect, aram, aras, arat, aramus, aratus, arant, or for future perfect, aro, aris, arit, aremus, aritis, arent. So again, there's the little box that I seem to be late on every time here, but uh, there's the forms. It's exactly what you'd expect for the perfect system in the active voice indicative mood. Now, as far as the passive voice indicative, Again, take the fourth principal part, which is exactly what you'd expect, latus a um, and to that you add the various forms of sum. For perfect, sum es est, sum es est sunt. For pluperfect, arama ras arat, arama saratus arant. And for future perfect, aro aris arit, aremus aritis arunt. So again, these forms are all pretty standard. Uh, there we go. You'd think I would have this down yet. Now, let's look at subjunctive. Is there gonna be anything different in the subjunctive? And the answer is no. We're gonna take our stem here, uh, F-E-R-E, uh, F-E, excuse me, F-E-R, and we're going to shift the vowel from, remember, we, uh, he beat a giant, so third conjugation verb is we're gonna shift from a short E to an A, so in, with fer am, and we add our, our present endings, M-S-T, must, this, in, so we end up with feram, feras, ferat, 
Faramus, Faratus, Ferant. For the imperfect, we're going to take the infinitive. I know it's an irregular infinitive, but we take it as is, F-E-R-R-E, -R -R -E, Ferre, and we add just simply our present tense endings, M-S-T, must descent. Ferremum, excuse me, Ferrum, Feres, Ferret, Ferremus, Ferretus, Ferent. Pretty, uh, pretty consistent there with exactly the pattern you'd expect. And of course, there is no future tense in the subjunctive. Uh, there we go. And as far as the subjunctive passive goes, same exact principle, but using the passive endings, ar, ris, ter, mer, many, inter, with that vowel shift there. And again, the infinitive with the passive endings and no future tense. And then finally, subjunctive uh, in the perfect system. Again, we uh, take the third principal part and take the stem, tool, and to that we add eri, E-R-I, and we add the present endings, M-S-T, must, dis, and There we go. Now, uh, for the pluperfect, you take the perfect, uh, perfect active infinitive, to lesse, and add your present endings. MST must descend. So it's to listen, uh, excuse me, to listen, to lesses, to leset, to lesemus, to lesetis, to leset. And uh, that's the subjunctive pluperfect. And of course, no future perfect. And then finally, the subjunctive perfect system. Again, fourth principal part, latus a um. But to that, we add the subjunctive form of sum. So we end up with sim, sis, sit, simus, sit, descent to those participial forms there. And for the pluperfect, same uh, fourth principal part, but again, we add the infinitive SM, uh, infinitive SA plus M, so SM, SS, ASET, SMUS, ASETIS, ASCENT. And so again, these forms are not irregular, but only in the present uh, tense, active and passive in three parts active and two forms um, in, the, in the passive voice. So you just have to memorize those forms and everything else should fall into place. Don't forget to study your vocabulary. We will have a quiz later this week.